Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, we're talking about SROs in the Wake County Public School System. Uh, as we all know, the, uh, a one-year contract was signed this year. And so we brought some of our school board members and uh, a parent with us tonight to talk a little bit about what that means for Wake County this year and uh, beyond. And so uh, to start with, I want to welcome uh, our panelists tonight. Uh, Monika johnson Hostler, Christine Kushner, both are our current school board members. Dr. Terrence Ruth, who is professor over at NC State. I'll introduce him in just a minute and also works with us. I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, Monika if you haven't met her before. She is a District 2 representative for the uh, Wake County School Board. She was first elected in uh, 2016 and again in 2018. Congratulations. She was a board chair in 2017. Um, in addition to her role, which is very important on our Board of Education, she's also the executive director of the North Carolina Coalition Against Sexual Assault. Um, Monika is also the policy go-to person often for our General Assembly and our state agencies in terms of federal legislations and broader anti-sexual violence movement. Since 2009, Monika has led the National Alliance to End Sexual Violence, uh, the voice in Washington for 56 state and territorial sexual assault coalitions, quite a big job, and 1,500 rape crisis centers uh, that in all working towards the issues of ending sexual violence and supporting survivors of sexual uh, violence. Her husband is a teacher in the Wake County system, and she has a daughter who is currently in high school here in Wake County. I also want to welcome tonight Christine Kushner, a professional policy analyst and freelance writer who has lived in Wake County since 1989. She also is a product of North Carolina Public Schools. I should have said that about Monika as well. She graduated from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She has a master's degree in public affairs from Princeton University. Uh, her work that she has done as a policy analyst, as a consultant and a journalist, have been focused primarily in the areas of public health, public health access, and public education. Christine has been active in um, PTA when her two children were coming through the school system. She's worked on many numerous school improvement teams, and she still volunteers now, which is pretty admirable, um, in our classrooms. Uh, she's a member of the Holy Trinity Greek Orthodox Church. Um, and is a William Friday Fellow for Human Relations through the Wild Acres Le Leadership Initiative. Christine has been on the Wake County Board of Education since 2011, serving two terms as chair and two terms as vice chair. And our last guest tonight is Dr. Terrence Ruth. Um, Terrence, thank you for coming too. Terrence is an education consultant with us, Public Schools First, and he's also a former administrator for the Wake County Public School System. He has that dual kind of hat. Uh, well, actually, he has three or four hats on tonight because he comes to us as former teacher, former principal, uh, as a father of a child in the public school system, and as a professional uh, educational policy researcher. Um, he has worked at the Friday Institute for Educational Innovation at NC State. He earned his master's degree in school administration and management and his doctorate in public affairs. Um, he has worked in school systems all across Wake in Florida and currently is a professor of social work at NC State and serves as pres president of the Justice Love Foundation. So um, he and his wife have a first grader this year in Wake County schools. So uh, with all those introductions done, we have quite a, a wonderful group of people with us tonight. We're really proud to have these um, knowledgeable people. We're going to move right on ahead and talking a little bit about, you know, what is um, what is a uh, research officer. So, Dr. Ruth, I was wondering if you could kind of start us off and talk to us a little bit about what is a school resource officer for those who may not understand. Uh, thank you again, uh, Yvonne and, and uh, Public Schools First for having me to to join this conversation. I'm a, again, I'm a former teacher, principal and now a parent of a student in Wake County Public Schools. And I have over 12 years of experience in leading schools of long-term suspended students. 
And so I wanted to start there because it gives you context around the idea of school safety, which then leads to SROs. So when an incident occurs in a school that warrants a suspension, typically that student will be referred to an alternative school setting or, or a learning location, like, like the, the one that I just mentioned that I um, have experience in. And then leading an alternative school, we did not always have access to SROs, but we also was able to make some inroads around school safety, like reduce incidents in school, on the increase in student attendance, an increase in parent involvement. And so if we are centering our focus of school safety, then it's helpful to provide the context um, to the use of SROs. And what I have witnessed over sort of those 12 years is that the best indicators of improved or preventative school safety efforts are responsive pedagogy used by teachers, staff sensitivity to students' life experiences, and an increase in black and brown teachers and personnel within the school. Um, and actually, most major school incidents consist of minor incidents that are preventable. Um, even if we just focus on major incidents, uh, Wake County Public Schools has a, actually a book that actually categorizes incidents in schools. And even if you look at the major incidents, uh, only a small percentage requires um, sort, of a, sort of an armed personnel. Um, but school safety is more comprehensive um, uh, of a discussion than SROs, and I wanted to position it there um, so that if we talk about its inclusion, um, it increase or decrease, that we're not necessarily deleting the topic of school safety. We are we are talking about a much more comprehensive discussion. So in 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 getting back to the question, um, again, a resource officer is a certified law enforcement officer that exists within the school, and again, not necessarily um, for crisis. Uh, and then also. Uh, uh, there are varying views on, you know, how we should use SROs um, and the effectiveness, effect, the effectiveness of SROs, I'm sorry. And some of the more commonly heard suggestions uh, for the need for SROs include intervening in fights and stopping intruders in, on school grounds. Um, there are also security measures to st stop school shootings. Um, and, and, and most fights that occur in schools, at least in my experience, um, did not require um, necessarily an SRO intervention. Um, and also research show that SROs do not prevent school shootings. And so there are some thinkers who suggest that maybe sort of how schools are physically designed um, may have uh, sort of a higher probability of preventing some of the school shootings or intruders. Um, and so in an SROs is a, is a supplement of that discussion as well. Um, and on the other side of the argument, there are thinkers who feel that SROs often escalate minor incidents and, 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 and lead to some major incidents. And um, I have seen administrators who default to the SRO when both present as, at, at an incident. Um, also, the number of uh, numbers are clear that you know black and brown students have a higher probability of being arrested or at least engage in an incident with an SRO, um, just based on the numbers that's produced, um, even if you zoom out to a national uh, study. So it's consistent with standard criminal data that suggested over-policing of certain profiles or demographics. And so those are the two sides and arguments. And so the lines are drawn pretty hard between the views, but we must re-engage the goal of school safety and, and evaluate the role of SROs in that reimagined concept of safety. Thank, thank you, Terrence, for laying the groundwork for us to talk about kind of what the two sides are that we're currently hearing from, what the research supports, and certainly for sharing your experience as an educator. Always great to be on a panel with an educator, especially as I speak more so from the policy um, side of this, but also a parent. And of course, thank you, Yvonne, for hosting this and for always being a huge supporter and proponent of public education, specifically public edu education in the great county of Wake County. So I appreciate being here and joining my colleague, uh, Christine. So, so I'll, I'll start by giving a little bit of the history, especially because I think it's been important for myself and many people on our board to start exploring where did this start and how do we get here, which I certainly believe that if we know the context of where we came from, it's much easier to think about how we move forward, um, steeped in both research and centering the experience of those students who are most impacted by this. Uh, contrary to what we've been hearing mostly is that SROs came into place because of Columbine. Um, SROs in Wake County were first placed here in 1993, by the way, is the year that I graduated from high school, because I've often been saying that I went through an entire public school experience without an SRO officer, but that certainly did happen in Wake County prior to Columbine. 
And by 1996, those local municipalities that Wake County currently has a memorandum of understanding with took over those responsibilities for those officers in our high schools located in their jurisdiction. So all the municipalities, um, uh, local law enforcement agencies support the schools in their municipalities. And for those schools that are not in um, our municipalities, but located in our um, county area, they're supported by the Wake County Sheriff's Office. And the same thing is true for our middle schools. Um, for those middle schools that have SRO officers, they are also supported by the Wake County Sheriff's Office. Um, if you'll note, a part of that history is we put those, uh, those SRO officers were in our school buildings, but there wasn't an MOU. Um, and so we're exploring that those MOUs were first put into place in 2009, um, all the way to two, 2014, and then we started to revise them um, my first full year on the board. And since then, we've covered revision that included, quite frankly, some community support and feedback, but not essentially enough. And we're certainly embarking upon how to how to broadly span the spectrum um, as we embark upon not just our third revision, um, but our fourth revision, which we gave an extension to um, through June 2020. And we are now in the midst of creating community conversations to explore the current MOU. Um, as I stated, the MOU includes all 11 municipalities, uh, the Sheriff's Department. What I didn't mention is, as many of you know, we have our schools that are in partnership with Wake Tech. And in those cases, our Wake Tech um, security officials are engaged as the SRO officers in those particular schools. Uh, the MOU specifically outlines the guiding principles that are agreed on by, by all parties. So certainly, as it's indicated, uh, the school system puts forth um, its guiding principles, but also the, then the local law enforcement engage with um, our attorneys on a final product that both parties can agree on. The ultimate goal is really to foster the positive relationship between law enforcement and the school community, but more importantly, that school community being led by our school administrators. And as you heard Dr. Ruth mention, really ensuring that administrators and educators alike are creating the line of distinction between what is the role of the SRO versus what's the role of our administrators um, and educators in discipline in our school buildings. So where are SROs in WCPSS? As I said, most of our middle schools um, now have SROs and those are filled again, not by the municipality, but by the Sheriff's Department. And every high school has a full-time SRO assigned to them as well. We have two municipalities that officers share um, in our elementary schools. That's the town of Holly Springs and Apex. Um, and they do state that the purpose of those SRO officers in those schools are to develop relationships, which we'll talk about a little bit more in detail. Um, but they are our first two municipalities to engage um, school resource officers at the elementary school level. So in total, there are 75 SROs that cover the 75 schools. And again, the breakdown is as below 34 high schools. Um, with SROs, 37 middle schools, and then four elementary schools that are shared between the town of Apex and Holly Springs. And I'll take it from here that we're a tag team this evening. Um, and I wanna thank Lynn and Dr. Brennan for having us here this evening. This is an important topic that our community wants to discuss. And one of the main things that is raised in this um, debate and these two views of looking at school resource officers are the costs. How much, you know, we talk a lot at our school board meetings and in public education about the uh, scarcity of resources for our schools. So folks are um, concerned about the, the funding that is going toward um, many of our services and specifically um, school resource officers. So we get about a million dollars in state funding for school resource officers and add to that about $112,000 in local funding. So our total cost from our Wake County budget for SROs is um, a little over $1.1 million. And as um, Ms. Johnson Hossler just outlined, we have 74, 75 SROs. So that's um, really $15,000 per SRO. And I wanted to put that in red because it shows that the school resource officer programs in our schools are largely subsidized by the municipalities and the law enforcement agencies that we work with. So the, the 75 SROs um, come a large part from local government, from local agencies. And um, so we are not able to take that money and person to person replace a school resource officer with a mental health professional or another professional that um, would give us the same 
adult in the building that um, school resource officers give us. And um, as has been outlined, school resource officers also play specific roles in our schools as licensed law enforcement, trained law enforcement officers in our schools. So it's a, um, that is a huge, you know, the, so that's the financial issue that I think we need to all keep in mind. Um, for um, next steps, we have um, been hearing a lot from the community around school resource officers. And so earlier this year, we had wanted to embark on a um, robust and in-depth conversation with the community before we uh, um, uh, extended the, or uh, renewed the memorandum of understanding in June, uh, then COVID happened. So we were not able to do that work as we had planned. So um, with that one year extension in June, one of the parameters that the school board put on that is that we wanted to go forward and have a real um, dialogue with the community, with stakeholders throughout Wake County about school resource officers with our law enforcement partners, because we still will need some sort of, um, uh, we need to have a formal relationship with law enforcement and the school system simply um, specifically so we can express our expectations for law enforcement when they come onto our school campus. We have to be very clear and collaborative um, that we set certain expectations for when law enforcement comes on campus, no matter if they're an SRO or um, any other law enforcement officer coming to a football game or any other uh, any a, a drug program or any sort of role that law enforcement will play on our schools. So that's the next step is that we're gonna focus on a revised plan for the 2021 MOU memorandum understanding, which will be with all those agencies throughout the county. But I also we also wanted to include in our um, in this presentation the next slide, which is some of the feedback we've been getting from students. And um, students are the most, I think, and, I, and perhaps and Ms. Johnson Hassler I think would agree with me, students are the most persuasive advocates we have in our school system. When they come to us, um, their voices really carry. And so this is some of the tweets that we've been getting about SROs. Um, and we have to acknowledge that some of our students, specifically in the summer of George Floyd and um, police violence that we've seen erupt in this nation, um, we have to acknowledge that many of our students do not feel safe around armed law enforcement officers. So what does that mean for our SRO program? And what does that mean for how SROs are trained in our schools? Um, we also are hearing from parents and families who um, feel the SRO does play a part in pro providing security for the school and giving school safety as Dr. Ruth so beautifully outlined, you know, that is one part if school safety is a critical issue, we have to look at the SRO in the context of, and so many of our families see the role that the SRO needs to play in that um, system. So it's, um, there are a dynamic um, and diverse system of views around this program in our school. So I think the next slide is a parent perspective from Dr. Reed. Well, again, uh, the, the the hat that I'm wearing now is, is as a father, and, and uh, it's different when you're, you're a principal and teacher, and then you have a first grader. Um, and and what worries me is is just the um, I started teaching in 2005, and my uh, audience, uh, in terms of the suspended students, were African American male. Um, and if I go and visit an alternative school right now, the, the, the demographics is the same. And so that's what worries me because I'm, I'm, I'm inviting and moving my son into the public school system. And so that's what worries me. Um, what, is, what, what, what really gives me hope is hearing from school board member Johnson and, and Kushner and in, 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 in their determination to engage the community around this topic and around the idea of what does it mean or to, what do an officer mean to a certain group of people and what do an officer mean to another and I think that's a significant um, conversation. What I have learned is that not all SROs are created equal and so there's some that are amazing. Um, I have one that's still my best friend today. Um, and he he knew his role versus the uh, the administrative role, and he was deliberate to stay within his you know parameters. So I, so so again, what I've learned as a principal and teacher that 
there are some SROs that are doing an amazing job and they're, they're creating amazing relationships. Um, then as a professor of social work, you see that there are sort of a tool belt of supports and services that you can uh, provide uh, alongside an SRO that could be just as dynamic. We're talking about uh, social workers, counselors, psychologists, that could be just as dynamic um, and preventative in many cases because uh, teachers uh, can see when a student is having a rough time, even before an incident occurs. And so you have a chance to create really a preventative model. And so that's what really gives me hope in this conversation. And next we have the timeline. So as I referenced, we are going to um, have a time for community feedback. We're looking to between now and November 1st to meet with stakeholders, to, to take the current feed to a memorandum of understanding um, and talk with the public as well as law enforcement. So we can get some feedback um, that will be presented to the board by the 1st of December. And then we are going to process that and, and work through giving our staff some guidance um, so that the district leadership can then go revise the memorandum of understanding and um, get a final document that we can agree upon with law enforcement um, that um, we will be put in place for the for the coming years. And part of that agreement outlines um, trainings that we expect school resource officers and other law enforcement folks to go through um, all around, you know, and I think um, Ms. Johnson Hosler and I have, have used the mantra de-escalation. And I know Dr. Ruth talked about that's truly what we want for our students is not to have the escalation of what some principals call knucklehead behavior into um, a criminal charge. I mean, that's sort of a, a summary of, of the worst case scenario is what we really want is professionals in our schools who can deal with students, who can um, monitor behavior, can, um, work with students to make sure that we, when we have any sort of disruption that it's de-escalated, that that student is um, surrounded by support systems so that it doesn't disrupt their education. I mean, that's the crux of the thing is that any sort of suspension, any sort of um, interaction with a disciplinary system is gonna disrupt the education of that student. And that's um, not the, that, that's absolutely not the end goal. And I also think it's important for us to underscore um, is something else that um, Terrence said, and that is the disproportionality of charges, disproportionality of suspensions that we have in our school. The trends overall are in the right direction and that those suspensions and, and criminal um, ref referrals are declining, but we still see the disparities. And that is something we as um, a school board and certainly as leaders in the community have to address. And it's something that specifically white people have to talk about in the context of that it is the black and brown students, particularly black students, that are disproportionately um, disciplined and um, referred out of our schools. Thank you, Ms. Kushner. And of course, I mean, you and, you and I tag team quite a few workshops before, and I will say what I always say. Um, it, is, it is really always a pleasure to have you speak into what's a real experience for students who look like me that I sit on this board and attempt to center their voices in all of our conversations. And it certainly makes a difference when you leverage your privilege to speak to their and center their experiences as well. So thank you very much for doing that. Um, and I, and I'm certain Dr. Ruth and I both, as he has a young student who's just starting in our school system, um, as we realize that centering their experiences for some seems like a controversial conversation, but it's not. The more Wake County public schools and schools across this country begin to really invest in the social and emotional learning is kind of our buzzword across the country when we talk about resiliency and the impact that trauma has on a kid's life and what it means in the school. You, you heard Terrence mention that I've not, and I can say this, I've never met a teacher who can't say, when that student came in my class today, I knew it was something. But what we haven't been able to do is ensure that everyone has those tools to either de-escalate, redirect, or quite frankly, create a scenario where that student um, is able to prevent from whatever was disturbing them that day when they walked into that school building and change the course of their day. And we do know that if we invest in social and emotional learning, that we truly can do that. The collage that you saw from our students, that, that's what their voices are asking us for. They're asking us to, to invest in their mental health. 
Um, I think all of us on this call, even though Dr. Ruth is younger, none of us grew up in an environment we, where we were openly talking about our mental health. And so I applaud this generation for calling on us to speak into their mental health and put it first and foremost. And while Wake County, like most schools across this country, are just dipping our to toes fully into this, our SROs have been trained in social emotional learning. Not all of our schools have even been trained. The same thing is true about the restorative justice model, which Wake County was a leader in developing that program with Campbell University. We haven't been able to expand that across our school district. And those are just two tools that could truly change the outcome and the trajectory of the student discipline disproportionate impact that we that both Terrence and Christine talked about. Those things could change easily, but quite frankly, we have to have several things. Funding matters to invest in it. We also have to have the ability to create the culture where we truly can change the hearts and minds and attitudes and beliefs, because that's really what investing in social and emotional learning is, is we know that folks come into those buildings with the heart to serve our students. What we also can't ignore is we all come in with our own baggage and all of us as human beings have blind spots. So our teachers, our administrators, um, our support staff, as I say, from the bus driver to the CNS cafeteria staff to all of the folks who wrap around our students, we all have to be invested in social and emotional learning. And I would be remiss if I didn't say what I always say, and that is we also have to take care of the health and well-being of the adults in the building. We have to create space that we're taking care of their mental health because there's nothing like a bad day for the adult in the building and a bad day for that student. That That is a ripe situation for when we see in a lot of the cases that we heard our students talking about where the SRO officer intervened when it really should have been a space where we could um, de-escalate for that student and for the adult in the building to create space that everyone was able to walk away knowing that we're a school system invested in social and emotional learning. Um, and I will you know, wrap that up by saying, I certainly do know that we have a board of nine who are dedicated to social and emotional learning and the real work is still ahead of us. And I think that we will, we will continue to make decisions like Christine outlined the robust review of the MOU because the advocates are our students and those are the most impressionable people on me as a school board member is to hear and center their voices. And we certainly remain committed to do that. But I'd be remiss if I didn't say we have a long way to go. We're just dipping our, to our toes um, as a board, but more importantly, as a society to own that our mental health and well-being is first and foremost, and then our students have the opportunity to access the high quality education that we seek to provide to all of our students. Christine, I wondered if you or Terrence had anything that you wanted to share around the issues of social emotional learning before we take some questions. Um, since this is such a huge component of of what's going on in our school schools, especially Terrence and I have been out for several years now talking a lot about adverse childhood experiences and how they impact a child's ability to learn, to even get to school sometimes, and then um, how critical it has been to make sure that every, as you said, Monica, that people understand from the bus driver, if a kid's getting on a bus all the way through the day, uh, all all those kind of things that impact how a child um, is performing or reacting or behaving. I wonder, Christine or Terrence, if either one of you wanted to add any of your thoughts about this critical issue. Well, one thing I do want to add is that as a board, we have been working really hard to advocate for expanded numbers of nurses, of school psychologists, of counselors, of social workers in our schools. It has been, I think, um, Monica, would you say an eight year, every year, asking for more of those professionals in our schools, whether it's from our local county government, but it truly needs to come from the state. The state um, has an obligation to give a constitutionally mandated education to every child. And these professionals, are part of that education. As um, Ms. johnson Hotzer pointed to, we, for the mental health and, and well-being of all of our staff, as well as our students, we need greater mental health support systems in our schools. That's become increasingly um, evident. And um, we are in North Carolina and in Wake County still at half of the ratios, recommended ratios for these professionals. I mean, our social workers do 
great work getting students to school, making sure they're secure, um, and making sure that they are come to school ready, fed, and ready to learn. Um, our counselors are there on the front lines to really make sure our students who have any stresses have someone to talk to. They, they run programs that allow our students to stay engaged and focused in their, in their education. Our school psychologists work with those students who have really high mental health needs that need to be addressed so that they can engage in their school community. So we, these professionals are critical to um, the functioning of a school community, and we don't have enough of those folks in the, in the world. And, and I, I would like to just quickly point out um, that some of the best school visits I've ever had was around leaders who knew and was sensitive to the moments of the school day where SEL was needed the most. And you can see these principals, they plan during the summer. They know, all right, when this bus gets, get, get, lets out, we have to make sure that we are. And so they, they even customize it to the bus. And so some of those leaders, they understand, and then they create a culture. So even if an SRO is in that building, they are obeying that culture of that school. So some of the greatest leaders, they are super sensitive to the ups and, and downs of a school day for particular types of students and they talk about it and they plan around it and so i think it's critical i think this slide um, says a lot about um, really school safety to me okay and i want to um uh, take just one second to uh, hold on i messed up the slide here just give me a second you know Okay, before we start questions, I wanna apologize to our audience. Uh, I never introduced myself. I am Yvonne Brannon, and I wanna introduce my colleague, Lynn Edmonds. Lynn is the Outreach Director for Great Schools in Wake and for Public Schools First NC. Um, so I apologize, I should have introduced us at the beginning, uh, but now I'm gonna ask Lynn to kind of help start us off with some questions uh, that She's uh, been keeping an eye out with the audience as well as some questions that we have been receiving from folks who um, ahead of this webinar tonight. So Lynn, I'm gonna let you kind of start off with a few questions and I'll, I'll join in in a few minutes. Thanks, Yvonne. And thank you um, to Monica and Christine for joining us. And thank you to Terrence. It's weird to thank you because your staff Plus, you've got these other hats that you wear, so we, we really appreciate your perspective. Slides, um, I suppose, let me, yeah, um, just go back if you would. I wanted to talk about the competing, this, it's one of the first slides about the competing views of SROs. And Terrence, specifically, I wanted to um, put you on the spot if I could. It, we do have legitimate concerns, I think, from some teachers that don't wanna be caught in the middle of a conflict between students. And depending on if you're certainly at a middle school or a high school, some of these students um, are full-size adults. <laughs> and so what, do you think SROs can be effective in um, calming down such scenarios, such as a fight, at intervening and de-escalating such scenarios where some teachers might have a concern about being that person that would have to intervene or would be expected to de-escalate that scenario? Are, SRO, are, are SROs valuable in those circumstances or is there some t other type of personnel that would be valuable instead of an SRO? That's a really good question. And, and I'm glad that teachers are honest about sort of their perception of the student's body size, et cetera, because they're communicating that even if they don't say a word. So I'm glad that they're honest about that. Um, but what I found is that there's teachers who build relationships and are willing to tag team with other teachers to work with a student. So sometimes it's a student that, I mean, a teacher that's already built a relationship with that particular student. And the school becomes small as the year go on. So you begin to know which teachers have a relationship with, 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 with uh, other students. But I also think um, that in those scenarios, when there's somebody with a relationship, even if it's a psychologist or social worker who's trained to engage in relationships, 
um, it diffuses the situation very quickly. Um, and even if the SRO comes in with a very calm demeanor, what they represent often makes it harder for them to de-escalate certain situations. And I'm not saying that they can, I've seen our SROs, SROs do that. But there's some people in different positions that would lean to a quicker de-escalation, um, especially in front of a group of students, especially if this incident requires one student performing in front of other students. Um, there are just other personnel that would be able to um, engage that situation um, it, 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 with a quicker result. That's a great response. I, I, I think, only, that's, thank you, Terrence, because I do think it's important, Lynn, to 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 lift up what Terrence just stated, which is the presence of a law enforcement officer certainly good, bad, or indifferent has a connotation to all of our students. So for some students, it may be a calming force, but for others, it may not be. And that's what I mean when I say we have to all recognize what our blind spots may be. Absolutely. And I think um, I agree that the concerns of teachers and of students, that's such a delicate balance, right? So we need to hear our teachers that have concerns, and even if it's a misguided perception, if they believe that the SRO um, represents some sort of protection, uh, whether or not that's accurate, we need to address the concerns of teachers that don't that feel vulnerable in such a situation and in such an incident. So Terrence, I really appreciate that perspective. And Monika, you're absolutely right. We absolutely need to understand and hear students that don't feel safer with the SRO intervening in such a situation or something like that. So I thank you both. Um, Christine, I also wanted to ask you about the um, $15,000 equivalent. There's a lot, I know there's a lot of misconception. People People think that we just simply need to move a budget line item and instead of paying SROs, we should use that money to fund counselors and school social workers and school psychologists. Can you talk a little bit more about your limitations in that regard, about, about just converting those funds? Because it's not just the amount of money, is that correct? Well, and um, we there are expectations, but they're not required. We to to have school. We are not required to have school resource officers in our schools, but we are required, I believe, to have some sort of agreement with law enforcement for how law enforcement comes onto our campuses. I mean, I think that's one option, but I think it really is. Um, and in the and in the city of Minnesota, in this Minnesota Minneapolis rather school district. They have the similar financial dynamics, but after um, the death of George Floyd, they did um, eliminate their SROs. And even though it was not equivalent, and they started with um, the the one tenth of what they needed, um, that's where they started from and advocated. Now, I think that police department and that school system is different than Wake County. Um, we've had different relationships here in Wake County, but that is one example of a school district in a city that um, that did just start with that small amount of money. Now, I think here where we don't have as robustly a school, uh, funded school system and where we don't have the adults in the building that we did 20 years ago per pupil, I think we have to think really hard about adding those social emotional supports much more robustly than we have um, and, and looking at what our relationship is with law enforcement and going forward. We need to at least right now look at a both and scenario, but I think we do need to emphasize the social emotional support those de-escalating professionals, those professionals that can help our students stay engaged in school and stay engaged in learning. Um, as well as, as we have to keep saying, addressing those disproportionalities that are disproportionately affecting our black students. Christine, I wanna um, add in on this um, comment, this area of discussion to all three of you. So we have a, a lot of conversation going on in our community for many years. Um, the I want to get rid of SROs, period, move them out of our schools, and then the group that's at the other end, we have to keep them. And then it sounds like maybe the school board is moving towards a transitional phase where we are redefining the role or re-examining the role of SROs, what they look like, what kind of training they have, and what their responsibilities are. 
Is, is that accurate in terms of where you're heading as you're examining this new MOU? Um, well, I think we've been doing that work since the MOU got first, when we had that first memorandum of understanding um, in 2008 or nine, whenever that first one was, that was, I think the goal is to have better trained school resource officers to present those expectations that the school system has to law enforcement, to have them to, to work collaboratively. I think that's been incrementally what we're, we've been looking at but I think going forward, we really need to hear from stakeholders in our community. I don't think our board, ha our board is open to the community feedback right now. That's what we want and need because we do have these varying and, com and sometimes competing views of school resource officers. I mean, I, um, Ms. Johnson and Hostler and I were in a town hall where she was on the panel where a sophomore student um, stated that she comes to school every day fearful of a school shooting. And my first reaction to that was, that is just not, that's not probable. Uh, yet that is how she feels every day. That is a student voice that's seared in my memory. Um, and so we have to look at these student perspectives of when they're coming, what they're bringing to our schools, how they're, um, and how our schools make them feel when they enter those buildings. And, and safety has to be primary. I mean, we're in the middle of a pandemic where the lack of safety in our um, public health environment has, has shut down our school buildings. I mean, this safety is paramount to everything. And so I think that's so important that Dr. Ruth started us off. Look, we have to look holistically and where does the school resource officer fit in that very big picture of school safety? And how so, can we make these relationships better? So I, I would uh, say to that comment about the holistic, so there are many people, when we were talking about SEL, that really feel like part of what's going on in our school is we do not have a rich enough um, restorative justice program, discipline, focused program that's not punitive, that's not suspension or expulsion. Um, could you talk a little bit about your practice so far with restorative justice, your views on it, if it's part of this of the, of the solution here in terms of uh, how you can have discipline focus at school, especially in high school and middle school, that don't lend themselves to punitive or law enforcement Absolutely. As I mentioned, Wake County was a leader in our partnership with Campbell University, um, which is longstanding and unfortunately not large enough program to be across multiple middle schools and high schools. Um, but four years ago, we had a pilot in our middle schools where we actually brought, brought in um, support staff to really take a look at did it matter in, in the 26 middle schools that we did it in, did it matter that there was an adult there that was a safe person for those students? And I can tell you, we looked at the data for those schools who were immersed in it for a full year, and more than half of them had significant changes in discipline problems that resulted to going to, in most of our schools, they go to the assistant principal or AP's office for discipline. They, they saw a, trauma, a dramatic decrease because everybody in that building, those students knew if I got to calm down in this school to Terrence's point, those leaders were committed to if student A says, not today, I can't do it. And they get up before they outburst, they allow those students to go to that support person. So they created a structure where then that support person worked with the AP to actually restore the harm that they could have caused in that classroom with that disruption. I mean, we know if we all think about it that as human beings we all might have a moment where we're just like i can't take it anymore and then we say okay i'm sorry i, I pulled it back together strangely enough we don't give students that opportunity in a school building because historically we haven't acknowledged that students are just like adults and have a range of emotions and we saw that program work um, as a result we got a kellogg foundation grant and we were able to start um, additional restorative practices. So, you know, we've had mixed reviews from parents, but we've been able to start Circle as early as our kindergarten students, really teaching them about the importance 
of getting your feelings out and getting to know people. What we know that relationship matters. We say that from adult to child, but it's also true for children. It's very different for me to be mad at Terrence if I now know that Terrence is upset because something happened at his house. That's very different if he discloses that in our circle in the morning. Um, and we don't give our kids enough credit for being um, to, for also having empathy. Our young people have just as much empathy and capacity for empathy as adults. And so for me, being able to witness those circles, um, we actually um, led adult circles so that they could actually come in and see what we were actually practicing in our school so people could experience it. But again, we've not done it district wide. And those are examples that I certainly will tell you I know could change and make the difference. My daughter went to one of the middle schools in our county where people said, I can't believe you're going to send her there. They're, you know, the police, not the SRO, but the police are called every day. And that principal was committed to changing that culture. And they changed their bell schedule by five minutes, started every morning with every single student and adult in that building, committed to circle and developing morning meetings. They created an equity team. And by eighth grade, they had not had the police called in that building at all. So we know it's possible when those adults are committed to changing the culture of that school, because you have to commit to it, not just as the administrator, but as a teacher and in conjunction with those students. And that's what I can tell you, I for sure saw um, in my daughter's own middle school experience is the commitment from the leadership to the students. And students hold each other accountable once you create the climate. And I will say, um, that um, under Dr. Martin's leadership as policy chair, Christine has picked that up. We've also been committed to changing um, our discipline policies that, you know, I think Dr. Martin and I both finally got our language on the same page that what he and I both are saying is we strongly believe that our policies should emulate what we want to see students do, not what we don't want them to see. And, and that's just a switch to a strength based approach of how do we create a policy saying, this is what we expect of you. This is the environment that we want you to have in your schools. Um, I certainly believe the public health model says that if you can change attitudes and beliefs, that's how you do it is by creating the strength based approach. And Wake County is certainly not as far as people would like us to be, but I do think that we're a leader in schools that have really started to really address our policies from a strength-based approach. We have a long way to go, but but we do have a board that's committed to changing the culture also in our policies. And I think the other thing Monica's touched on that we have to underscore is student voice and agency. That's right. If students are owning their school climate, that's their community. They are going to be part of that and they're going to want it to be a calming engaged environment. So I think giving students voice and giving them agency is something we really need to focus on. And that's totally, you know, that that is not just for discipline and, and climate, it's for education and engagement and academics and sports and all of that. We we I think we need to lift up student voice and student agency. I, I would I would say that um, I am <laughs> Monica, I had children who went through the school system that did not have an SRO. Um, but what they did have uh, in, it was uh, uh, kind of more like a, I, I guess you would say, a safety person, someone who did not have a gun, but they were a security person who would walk the parking lots, making sure people didn't come on campus uh, and park illegally. They were uh, went through the building to make sure the doors are locked or weren't whatever. They did not carry a gun. And when there was an escalation at my children's high school, and there were several, um, the principal made the decision to call law enforcement. And um, that doesn't mean that there still aren't some bad things that could happen right there with that, with that comment, the principal call. But it seemed like um, there was more opportunity for um, uh, a variety of, of, of people and the educators to be involved in a decision that wasn't just left to the police officer's decision. Is that fair? I mean, right now, do the SROs basically operate independently in terms of calling the police or escalating an issue? Do they make these decisions? This is something that the public asks me and Lynn all the time. Who's in charge of the SRO? The principal is the leader of the school building and campus. The principal is the leader and the principal needs to have that authority and agency. And that's a part of the training that we've been committed to re 
investing in to ensure that not only are we saying the principal has the leadership and agency, um, but that's actually what's happening in those buildings. And so, um, again, we keep reiterating that it certainly still should be the principal as the as the lead learner in that building should also be making the lead decisions um, of how to address all of those issues in their building. And I think many principals do see that um, that SRO as a partner, and but the principal needs to define that role and partnership consistent with the memorandum of understanding. But in the end of the day, as people, the the principal is needs to lead that building. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I've, I've no, I, I've experienced the same. It, it, the principal, depending on how the principal engage and negotiate that relationship, you, the, you get the result of or the outcomes and when incidents do occur. So, no, I, I agree. The principal normally, from my experience, have taken the lead and, and determined the relationship in the building. And I think families and parents and, and students need to um, give feedback to their principal if they see some disequilibrium with their school climate whether it's with the sro or anything else if they don't think the you know the, the staff is doing what they need to do they the principal really should be the linchpin for that communication and setting those expectations and then that fits uh that's good to hear because it kind of fits with some of the things that um lynn and terrence and i have been working on around the concept of resilience building resilience and children teaching them resilience it's around that um, it starts with school climate and that the school climate actually starts with the principal because the principal kind of can set sets the tone for you know how the school is going to operate and it goes through and how that's going to operate in the gym in the cafeteria in the classroom in the hallways and that um, if that climate is built around restorative justice the research shows as Monika pointed out from from your research it, it does make a difference it does make a difference. Um, and if the recognition of, of ACEs is really key. So I am very grateful to you, Yvonne and, and Terrence, for doing that work in our with our school leaders, because it, it, that is going to take more than the principal. We need our teachers, our bus drivers, all of our staff members to recognize the, those ACEs in our students and in our staff. I mean, That's to be right. honest, we all carry around our adverse childhood experiences that affect everything we do and we need um, and that further recognition when the teacher can recognize how do I help that student get back in their zone of resilience and that what that the creme work that we're trying the community responsive work that we're trying to do as well in the school system um, to help students stay in that that zone where they see feel safe and that they can um, respond in ways that are constructive I mean we need our teachers to recognize um, how and our all of our staff to recognize students when they're when they're in need of that reinforcement. Well, one thing I'll share with y'all is that Lynn and I are going to be meeting and having a webinar. We hope everybody here tonight and all of you will join us on the 21st of September, when we're going to be talking to the uh, Youth uh, Education Youth Alliance, um, and they have a proposal they're floating out there around peace building. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know their concept is that schools should be built on peace building skills and that staff that interact with students when they have what I, I would call not always discipline, discipline problems, but when the, the way they help children navigate the issues they face at school academically, socially, and so forth is around the concept of restorative justice and peace building. So um, I hope you'll come back and hear their proposal. They have some um, some notions about how they would rather uh, replace SROs with what they call peace builders. But for me, as an outsider looking at this issue as a former social worker and a researcher in um, that deals a lot with looking at the, the impact of social workers as parents and, and psychologists and so forth, what I see is that um, the, the in, in between all this is the concept of having that additional staff y'all been talking about. You know, if we can park the concept of SROs for one second over here, we clearly are seeing even the, every advocate group um, talk about you've got to have those, those people with those helping professional skills to help staff and kids learn how to talk and communicate 
show, not just, um, I agree with you, Monique, the most wonderful thing you've said tonight is our kids have empathy. What our kids don't have is a chance to practice empathy. Mm -hmm. And that's what this whole concept around restorative justice is so beautiful about. So I love that what y'all were saying. I love also, uh, I'm very intrigued by what the our next guests on the 21st are going to share in terms of what they're looking at. But I do think that all of these things talk about the resources we don't have, either in staffing or funding. And uh, I, I want to give you a chance to talk about that if you'd like to add anything there. Absolutely. Thank, thank you for bringing that up. Um, when the Education Justice Alliance brought Peace Builders to me, literally my first full year on the board, um, I think I've brought it up every year since then. Um, and I've been asking us to figure out how to do a pilot. I finally got to a, one of the municipalities that was interested uh, and then we couldn't work out the details and here we are with COVID. Um, so I've been an advocate for at least for me for something that felt um, felt monumental as a shift for many people that if we try to pilot Again, I think Peace Builders uh, capitalizes on the beliefs of building both empathy and resiliency skills in the building with adults who are trained to do that and ensuring that our students have the capacity to do that. Um, the program that, at least the, the research that I've read that they've shared with us and looking at the school districts where it's been implemented, um, they've been successful. And they've certainly been in far more urban areas than Wake County. And so I'm a firm believer that we live in a county that has some of the smartest people, literally, um, that we can figure this out. But it is going to require us to figure out how to invest properly in building a program that doesn't actually create a space where, because again, what we know to be true is if you create a new program and you don't have buy-in, it takes the program from the beginning. And so that's always been my hope that we could at least start with a pilot to actually display the differences that we've seen, which is exactly what we've done with restorative justice. And I'll end with, but what I do hope is that we'd be able to expand it much quicker than we have been able to do our restorative justice work. And so that's my commitment is to start with seeing how this, how we can create this in our schools and then how do we build upon it and have a plan to actually grow it district-wide. Lynn, I want to make sure, did you have any other questions on your sheet there that you'd like to insert right here? No, I do. Um, so someone asked about our counselors that we do have, and clearly we don't have enough, but the ones that we do have in our schools are pretty overwhelmed and overworked with tasks around um, more academic needs. So the question is, how much time do counselors actually have to address behavioral issues? Well, um, so so our state luckily created um, a few years ago a percentage that was supposed to kind of create a better balance between educational testing tasks versus actually the social and emotional supports that counselors, um, as I say, still remember my middle school counselor who became a, 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 a superintendent who really changed my life as a young girl with a lot of bullying because she brought us in and actually addressed it. That's what I know to a counselor to be. And quite frankly, in talking to our counselors in Wake County based on their student their workload and we have some of the smartest and brightest students that they're also preparing them to go to college, ensuring that they get in the right coursework, they don't have enough time. Um, when I sat down with our counselors who go through a certification program, uh, that's the first thing that they all say is, yes, we want to work on attendance. Yes, we want to work on academics, but we also want to create space um, to address student, student well-being and they don't. So in terms of hours, um, I don't know, but I certainly will tell you the counselors that I've personally talked to feel like it's a very small portion of their work week, that they actually have the time to do that. Well, and I know we've heard that actually in their testimony when they've gone before the Board of Commissioners to advocate for more funding and more help. Um, they have talked about their just overwhelming workload. And Christine, I want to piggyback on the point you made that funding for those positions really does belong to the state. Um, that responsibility belongs to the state. And I think our commissioners um, have done what they can, but it's it's something we all need to, everybody watching, and, and we're not going to stop advocating for uh, the state to fund more of these helping professionals in our schools. I would agree. And if the state were doing its constitutional duty, uh, this the, the we would not have to augment 
our salary schedule. We would not have to um, fund positions that should be coming from the state. I mean, we are um, billions of dollars have been removed from public education uh, spending every year by this legislature. So we need to have uh, Leandro decision has given us a blueprint for bringing our education system back to where it needs to be and what and, and we need to follow that outline and that blueprint. We have a great opportunity in the next 10 years to make that yes. happen. And in the West Ed recommendations, it specifically talks about the need for more helping professionals. That, that was really exciting to see that in there because it really speaks to something that I've heard all of y'all talk about a lot over the years, which is the whole child approach. That we don't just have a kid who shows up at outside the classroom door, we have to consider the whole child and the things that are going on with their life, their family, um, uh, their health needs, um, and those kind of things. Um, I, Lynn, I, I wanna make sure before I asked our guests if they'd like to close up, if you have anything else on your list? questions i'm all set the chat is kind of quiet this evening which that's okay we i think we've had a good conversation and it's nothing that we can't pick up on, mon on monday september 21st with right. the education justice alliance um, and and you all would happily agree to come back and join us again right oh, absolutely God. I'll gladly be here. And then I can eat and listen to them because right. you know, right. you know thank you turn my camera off and have supper and listen. Right, fair, fair trade, fair trade right there. Um, so I want to give each of you a chance to say any closing remarks you want about this issue. It has been probably the most um, contentious issue that we might See, other side, other than assignment, I understand. But other than assignment, when we look at some of the issues that really concern parents, uh, pit them against each other sometimes, as you've said, is the idea of how we, we deal with our kids in our schools, how we keep kids safe, how we foster their academic and personal growth, and how we balance all that within the operation of a school, uh, the finances, the resources. So anything y'all would like to say in closing, we welcome. Just a simple thank you for having us. And like Christine, I will certainly be back to listen to our young people. I had the opportunity to have a brief conversation with them earlier today. And, and I will say here what I said to them, that there's no more impressionable group of people on my decision making um, than those young people. Teachers matter, adults matter, our community stakeholders matter. But the, the real stakeholder here, the, the life that we, quite frankly, as adults have the opportunity to create the biggest changes in our students. And so um, I think this conversation was warranted and I appreciate having both uh, Dr. Ruth's parental perspective. And as always, it's great to be among the great company of my colleague, Christine, and thank you, Yvonne and Lynn for making this happen. It really opened the door for people to understand the complexity of this issue, but also how, how how we all can actually work together to make the best outcomes for the whole student in all of our buildings. Thank you very much for having us. And I echo everything Monica just said. I mean, I think she brings that, her perspective is so valuable on this issue um, and her deep experience, her professional experience, but also bringing um, that, her empathy with our students just shines through her voice. But, um, so I think that's what we are looking for as a board. We're looking to hear from our students, from our families, from our teachers and um, educators throughout the system. We need to make sure that we're hearing from all stakeholders around the role of our school resource officers and then broadly just school climate and school safety. How can we go forward as a school system to make sure that we're emphasizing um, and, and holding up the right policies and procedures so that our students feel safe when they walk into the building and our teachers are able to focus on teaching and learning and the support staff are able to make sure that um, folks are getting what they need. I mean, it's, a, it's truly a school community that we need to foster. And what's the role of the SRO and what's the role of um, our stakeholders? So thanks for having us here tonight and to everyone out there, we wanna hear from you. Good, Terrence. It was a pleasure to, uh, to to be a part of this conversation. Thank you, school board member Johnson and Kushner. Thank you, Yvonne and Lynn for having me. Um, and I just want to close with, um, I'm glad that we ended the discussion on SEL 
um, because I've had I've had the privilege to work with some of the most wonderful, kind-hearted students, but they were your bigger students. They were the ones that maybe had a tattoo or two, uh, but they was they were still scared of the dark. They still watched SpongeBob. They still, you know, still was a mama's boy. So I, I'm glad that we centered the discussion there. And uh, so thank you again. I think it's a wonderful conversation. I will tune in on the 21st. Okay, great. And I, and in closing, I would simply say that the most encouraging thing to me as a public education advocate, as a community member, as a grandparent of children in the system, uh, as a former parent of kids in the system, is that um, I do have a long view, and the long view is that we have made substantial progress. Uh, the, the, the good short-term view is that I think the school board has signaled pretty clearly that you're ready to make a change. I like to look at the one-year contract as kind of a commitment to the community that you made, that you put that placeholder there, and now you've invited the community into this conversation. And I think it has to be bigger than, than one organization. Uh, it has to be bigger than Great Schools Awake and bigger than the Education Justice Alliance and bigger than several other groups. It has to be community-based, and parents are going to have to speak up. And I love that students have a role. I, I have to say, I don't know how my teachers would have been able to handle um, me and my classmates when we were in high school if we could tweet. Uh, uh, I think it, it might have been quite scary. <laughs> uh, we were the class of the, we were the hippies, the 60s and the 70s, and my gosh, we didn't have uh, those tools, of social media tools. But I do think it's really wonderful uh, to see, and I appreciate that you guys included tonight, showing snippets of their voice. I think we're at a landmark opportunity that we haven't talked about COVID tonight, but COVID actually has opening the door a lot more to a lot of virtual conversations, a lot more community engagement in a bigger way that we can do on the internet. And I, I think it has opened up our hearts to looking more at the humane side of issues. Um, and that's what all of y'all have been talking about in your presentation, is how we understand and respect the people's humanity. Adults of all ages, teachers, bus drivers, principals, are students of all ages, all sizes, as Terrence said. And I think that's the beauty of where we are, that we have a chance to take a deep breath here and listen to each other. And I think we'll come out, I hope, with a much better approach. Um, Terrence and I, in our presentations, always say at the very end of everything we do that it just takes one strong, loving, caring adult to make the difference. The difference in the school climate, the difference in a classroom, the difference on a bus, that it can just take one strong, caring adult. And we, ask, we always ask everybody to be the one. Be the one caring, loving adult, parent, student, that can make a difference in someone else's life. And so I'm very excited and very hopeful, and we look forward to the conversation that's coming up in a couple of weeks, um, because I think that's really important to hear um, a, a new model, an exciting model, a different way. Um, and I have to say, as a child of the 60s, I love peace builders, come on. You, you have to say that's a pretty cool concept, right, Monica? So yeah. thank y'all for coming tonight. And thanks to our audience. Uh, we are recording this. We will be posting it. And we look forward to, to, as Lynn said, we'd like to have you come back again as you make progress through that timeline you've got, as we hear from other community members, and as you get further along in some of your plans, we'd like you to come back and talk some more, especially when you figure out the, well, how the community is going to be involved in your review process. Uh, you had on there in March sometime that you wanted the community in input. So we'd love to be involved with helping you facilitate that. So good night to everybody. Enjoy your weekend. And thanks again for coming. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Good to Bye. see everyone. Night. Good night. Oh, I forgot to say, I have to say it right now. Connect with us. Please uh, like our Facebook page. Join us on Twitter. Follow us. Sign up for our newsletter. We would appreciate it, and you'll be able to stay um, in tune with all the things that um, we're doing, uh, all the newsletters we're putting out, all the research we're doing, all the fact sheets we have. So I would get fired if I didn't tell you to follow us, tweet us, like us, 
Peace. Y'all. Thanks. Good night. Uh, this is really goodbye now. Bye-bye. <laughs>